as a child, um, starting from about age, I guess about seven, my father got into drugs really bad, and that's when we started witnessing all sorts of violence in the home. When my father was abusive toward my mother, we would witness most of the domestic violence, and then we'd have to go to school the next day. There were times where the violence was so bad that we ended up in battered women's shelters, and so we were missing school for three days at a time. It's like, how do you explain to your friends where you were for three days? So, I mean, we'd come up with stories, but, you know, she always went back, and that was hard for us because we didn't have a say in the decision because we were children. I felt very angry toward my father and confused. He and my mother had fought one night. She ran out to the neighbor's house to call the police, but left us inside with him. And we were inside with him while the police are outside with our mother. And he's telling us, you know, don't open the door. You know, I love you. And it's just like, as a child, you're really conflicted because the authorities are telling you, you know, open the door. We need to get you to safety. But your father's telling you, I love you. And, you know, don't get me in trouble. So that was hard. At times, I felt like I was split between choosing if I love my mother or if I love my father, or if I love both of them, if I loved either of them, because of the things that we were going through, it just seemed like a lot for a child to carry. I was really upset and angry on the inside. Most of it came out in my writing because I wrote a lot as a child, and I was very emotional through the writing. I was a straight-A student. I always did well in school, so I kind of compartmentalized everything. And it was like, when I'm at home, I deal with home, but when I'm at school, I'm going to do my best because, you know, there were rewards. People would tell me how great I was because, as a person, I felt terrible. My self-esteem was really low. I didn't feel pretty. I felt like people could see on me what I was going through. Witnessing all of the violence and not being able to get help for it, not get, getting help from counseling and internalizing it all, I felt like I wasn't worthy of anything. And then after a while, the teacher's compliments even started to not really mean anything. It's like, it's just what I do. You know, I get an A, so what? When my mom left our father, we ended up in a small town called Hemingway, South Carolina, and it was far away from everything you can imagine. We lived with my grandfather and one of my aunts in this small like shack. There was no air conditioning. There were like three bedrooms, but my uncle had a bedroom, my aunt had a bedroom, my grandfather had a bedroom. So that means my sister and I slept, and my mother all slept in one bed in the room with my aunt, and she had her own bed. And it was like not clean water. You had to go to my aunt's house to get clean water because the pipes were rusty and it was a mess. The largest corporation that was there was the only Tupperware manufacturing company in the United States. The jobs were competitive, and if you didn't work there, you had to travel like 30 miles to Myrtle Beach to work at the hotels. So things were tough. I started noticing my mother's deterioration almost right away when we moved to South Carolina. She started using alcohol a lot because she couldn't find a job. Her family didn't rally around her. And I think that's what hurt the most, to see that she brought us to a place where even as kids, she would tell us that she was the black sheep of the family, but she went back to them and they still treated her that way. And that was hard. And at that point, I started to see the weakness of my mother and to not see her really bounce back from that, that hurt a lot. It made me feel like, I was weak because I'm a product of her. And if she can't do better, then how is she going to lead us to li live better lives after the domestic violence? I did start acting out. A lot of it was trying to get attention from boys. I wasn't promiscuous, but then I met this guy who ran with the older crowd. He was only a year older than me, but if you looked at him, he looked like he was three, four, five years older. And he smoked, he drank, he didn't go to school. And I was very naive. I did a lot of things thinking that if I do it, he'll be happy and then he'll want to be better and change for me. After that, I got into another relationship with another guy. It was around the time, my senior year of high school, so I was about 18, and I slept a lot. 
Um, I started falling asleep while I was driving. I just didn't realize that it was depression. I didn't want to go anywhere. Even though I have this boyfriend, I didn't want to go anywhere. And then it got to the point that he and I would start having arguments and I started cutting. We got into a really bad argument and that's when he ended it with, you're just like your mother and he yelled it at me and that was when I like ran in the kitchen, grabbed a knife and I like just like ripped it across my arm. I did grow to enjoy the pain because I couldn't bring myself to talk about it to anyone. I didn't feel like anyone would understand. So when I would feel bad and I would cut, I would feel better because it's like, okay, that's done. And temporarily I'd feel like, okay, I'm, I'm okay. And you know, I don't have to do this again. But the next time I felt really bad or I felt like I was getting to like a depressed state, I would do it again. And I didn't go seek help for it. Looking back, I could have really hurt myself. A lot of my family don't know what this came from. It's a reminder of how low I had gotten. And I don't ever want to go back to that place. I ended up staying with him longer than I should have. If I felt good on a day, it was like his job to make me feel bad. It was verbal abuse back and forth. And then at one point it got physical and I still stayed. This is the second guy that I've given myself to physically and you know, I don't want to have to be with anyone else because then that would make me whatever label society labels that as. And then I just want to have one person, I'm going to have all my kids with this person and it's going to work, it's going to be beautiful. And then it became financial abuse. He would quit jobs and then he would go into my bank account and take money. So, you know, that goes on for a while, then we have the first child. And so it's like, okay, well, what do we do? So I'm finding daycare, I'm finding the pediatrician, I'm doing all of this. I'm taking off from work to do the appointments. He does what he does. Then it becomes, okay, I'm not gonna pay the daycare bill. So he wouldn't pay the daycare bill. So then I would literally take weekend trips to South Carolina, seven and a half hours to drop the kids off to my mom because we couldn't pay for daycare until I got paid again so that I could make up the balance. Got to the point where I couldn't see me and my children being out on the street. The rent was not going to be paid that month, and I had had an offer to move in with a family. I was like, no, I can't do it. I'm going to try to make it work. There was one time I was holding our son, and we were arguing. He slapped me so hard that I fell back onto the bed with our son. Something just snapped, and it's like, what are you doing? The next month, the offer was back on the table again. It's like, come with us, repair yourselves. Um, get back on your feet and I ended up filing for divorce and that's how that relationship ended. I have three children. They're great children. My new husband, he's saw the hurt, the pain. He saw the self-defeated attitude. He saw that I was trying to not make it work because I felt like I was so messed up from all the other relationships, from you know carrying this little girl along who I hadn't let go because of the pain that she had. And he's letting me be me and evolve as I should and supporting everything I do. I would like to say to victims, survivors, and abusers that every day is the opportunity to change. Every day is an opportunity to take one step forward in the right direction. Who is Shanette today? Shanette is a creative mind power, a great mother, a great wife, and she's raising some powerhouses in her children. And I'm a survivor.